All right, we're going to give this a round two with the mic. Hopefully, we don't have any crackling and see how that works. But uh, I'm going to invite you to turn again to John 17. We are in the middle of a series that we've entitled Gospel Life, uh, Going to Our World. And um, taken from the Great Commission in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, Christ clearly gives instructions to the church that we're to go proclaim the gospel, to spread that to the world around us in their everyday life and things that we do. And um, he prayed then, as we've been looking at in John 17, for his sent ones his apostles, that here's what they're going to need to do as they go out. What are things that are going to be important for them? And he, he prays that they're going to go out and be living out the gospel in their lives and living it and spreading it, that they would be kept from the evil one. And we looked at that and the ramifications and details of things come around now. We, we looked at his prayer that they'd be sanctified by truth and your word is truth. And today we're going to try to finish up this prayer together and look at some, some practical elements of it. But I want to I wanna first ask a question. And I'm going to preface it by giving a little bit of an example of it. Um, for the past several years, I have had the, I'll call it a privilege, uh, of coaching uh, some soccer teams. Anywhere from U13s down to U8s. And this is my second year in a row coaching a U8 soccer team, which is quite entertaining, I can tell you. Uh, we've got nine little boys out there on that team, and, um, and at times, they, they want to wrestle more than play soccer, um, and I make them run laps. We're going to practice, and we're going to do what we need to do, and, but I've learned with that age group, because you're having some of them that are even five years old that are coming in, that some of them don't know what, the, what, what any of the terms are in soccer. They don't know how the game is played. What happens when the ball goes out of bounds? Where can I use my hands? Even just yesterday in our game, we had uh, twice a goalie way outside the goalie box scooping it up in his hands. And then we had another player who wasn't the goalie scooping up in his hands. And, um, and so it's, it's constantly trying to teach them, here's the, who's the, here's the fundamentals of the game and here's what you got to do. Um, and we're working on that. In fact, I remember as we had gotten to our first practices, I was trying to determine which kids are better on offense, which kids are better on defense. And so I asked them, do you prefer to play offense or defense? They just stared at me. <laughs> like that didn't register. And so I had to like rephrase it. Okay, do you like to score goals or do you like to stop the other team from scoring goals? Oh, yeah, I like to score goals. And so trying to work with this, with this group has been a lot of fun. And But I asked them, I asked them a question at, at our third practice, um, and I asked them this as we start out each game. I asked them, hey guys, what is our purpose? What are we trying to do out here? And, and the question, the answers that I got was, some said, well, we're, we're trying to pass the ball around and work as a team. Another one said, well, we're trying to have fun. That's our objective. None of them got the right answer. And I said, That's, those are all good things. But if you pass the ball around and you dribble and you have excellent dribbling skills and you never do what we're supposed to do, we still don't win. I said, the object is to score goals and to keep the other team from scoring. That's our object. If we don't know what we're doing out here, we can do a lot of stuff, but never win the game. And so I, I asked the question to the church, what is the church's goal? What is our purpose? What are we to be doing as a church? Because we can be doing a lot of stuff and be pretty good at it. But if we don't know what our purpose is, we can be wasting a lot of time and never complete what God wants us to complete and never really win the game. So I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to answer the question really as it's in our church constitution. So I'm going to put that before you here this morning. It says our mission is to make disciples. I'm going to stop there for a second. Our mission, and that's taken directly out of Matthew 28, verse 19, to go make disciples of all nations. And so our mission is to make disciples. And the word there, literally in Matthew 28, has an evangelistic, 
emphasis. It's a one-time action to make a disciple. Go out and make disciples of all nations. And then it talks a little bit further in our Constitution by, or how we're going to do that, by constantly and creatively seeking to win the lost to faith in Christ by making the message of salvation by faith in Christ alone known everywhere. And here's it breaks it down. By personal, so we're going to be doing personal evangelism, corporately, or corporate witness, and that's going to be our, our outreaches and things that we do as a church, whether it's the preaching services, Awanas, whether it's a zone, soccer camp, the men's tailgate, where we're going to have the gospel presented at it, uh, corporate witness, or, or and, not or, but and, by prayer and financial support of our missionaries worldwide. So our efforts are, as we're going to make disciples by making Christ known so they can trust in him, is that we're going to do that personally. We're going to go out and we're going to share the gospel with our neighbors and people around us, our co-workers, our friends, our family. We're going to go and, and be involved in a corporate witness, endeavoring to, to unite as a church in efforts for that. But also in partnering with missionaries to have the gospel be spread around the world. So that's our purpose. Philosopher George Santayana once stated, Imagine people going to work day after day without knowing their company's business. Yet that's exactly what happens when church members don't know what their church is trying to do. Fanaticism consists in redoubling your efforts when you've forgotten your aim. We don't want to just ramp up and work harder if we don't know what we're trying to accomplish. What we're trying to accomplish is to see people come to Christ for the glory of Christ. And so we're going to put our energies into that. That's our goal. And, and so that's, by the way, is exactly what Christ modeled for us. If you examine the life of Christ and look at his ministry and what he did, it was a gospel life. That's what he was doing. For instance, Luke 2, as a young boy, he's in preaching to the people there in the temple because he had to be out of his father's business. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 15, it says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. In John chapter 4, he says, I must needs go through Samaria. And we see him sitting at the well in Samaria, witnessing to the Samaritan woman there, drawing her to salvation. In Mark chapter 4 and 5, we witness Jesus as he crosses the Sea of Galilee, going over to the Decapolis, the Gentile region that the Jewish people would never even go into. And he goes over there so that he can meet a, a demonic man who is demon possessed and bring him out of that give him freedom and bring him to repentance and new life in christ his ministry was constantly about other people in luke chapter 4 43 to 44 he says unto them i must preach the kingdom of god to other cities also for therefore am i sent and he preached in the synagogues of galilee even think about all the way there at the end in Luke chapter 23. There he is, nailed to a cross, bearing the sins of the world, bearing the shame and, the, and, and all the punishment from God as God pours out his wrath. And there is a, a thief next to him saying, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he assures him, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus, from the very beginning of his life and all the way through his ministry and all the way to the very end, was about gospel evangelism. Gospel life is Jesus. He models it for us, and that's why in Luke chapter, or I'm sorry, in Acts chapter one, where Luke is giving the account, he says, the account of all that Jesus began to do. This is the beginning of the going forth of the gospel of, of grace to the world around us. Jesus began that ministry, and we are called to continue that ministry. He modeled it for us, and then he commissioned us for it. That's why we see that in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Great Commission in, in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the, the reiteration of that just before he ascends in Acts chapter 1. You shall be witnesses for me in, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. 
It's not, it's not vague what our call and purpose is. It's very clear when we study Scripture. And then Paul adds to it in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 20. He says, now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciled the world to himself. Not imputing their trespasses to them. And has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. That's our role now. We continue doing the work that Jesus began to do. And so, the question really goes back to is, are we passionate about doing that? Are we being obedient to doing that? Are we redoubling our efforts and ramping up with a passion to complete that call that Jesus has given us? Well, I, I pulled out a, a Barna study that I was researching on, and they had done a study back in 1993 where they partnered with Lutheran Hour Ministries to research reasons why people did and did not engage in intentional outreach. And, um, and then they're going to redo this. And they look back now 25 years later. And they ask some follow-up questions. To see the results now. And where our culture of Christianity is today. And here's what they found. A growing number of Christians. Don't see sharing the good news. As a personal responsibility. Just 10% of Christians in 1993. Who had, sh had shared about their faith agree with the statement that converting people to Christianity is the job of the local church as opposed to the job of an individual. So just 10% just ten percent said, no, that's really the job of the corporate church. It's not my job. 1993, the Christian church that was being polled, Christians across the country said, hey, it is a personal responsibility of Christians. 90% agreed that it's a personal responsibility. Now asked 25 years later, um, the, the, the divergence here says that um, it, it says now that number has moved from 10% to 29%. So 29% now say, no, it's really the church's responsibility. That means 71% are saying that, that it's a personal responsibility. But the rest are saying, no, it's, it's up to the church to do this. It's not my job. And they found as well the most dramatic divergence over time is on this, on this statement. They made a statement, every Christian has a responsibility to share their faith. In 1993, 9 out of 10 who had shared their faith agreed. Today, that number has dropped to 64%. So only 64% of, of, of Christians in America are saying that they have a responsibility to share their faith. And so we've got to get out and... To do it. We, we, should, we should be able to come in here on, on times when we get together as a church family and say, hey, who did you talk to about Christ this week? How did, how, did your, how did your meetings go as you talked to people and you shared the gospel? Because that's our objective. That's our, that's our goal. I, I mean, I'd be like going to a soccer game and, and we would ask afterwards, did you can't get a chance to score any goals? Did, did you shoot the ball at all? Well, we ought to be able to say, hey, how did your outreach go today? Or this week. Did you get a chance to talk to your neighbor, that coworker? How's it going there? When I was working in Florida, while I was working through my master's degree, I worked at ADT Home Security Systems. And every Monday morning, we had a staff gathering meeting. And they would discuss, okay, what's your objective? How are you going to work on reaching, getting into to knock doors or get opportunities to, to sell home security in homes this week? And we would talk about it. How did your meetings go last week? And all this stuff. And there would be this this emphasis and he would drive that hey this is what we're doing this is our objective what's well, the same thing here in in what we're called to do and people say well i'm passionate about winning souls are we are we are we seriously passionate we're gonna say man i'm gonna make sure that i'm talking to people about christ sometimes i think i think if we were to have a, a different emphasis it might change it I, I i thought about this week and i and i was thinking about even just how our my uh, boss in florida used to sometimes give incentives um if you knock so many doors this week i'm going to give you this incentive or if you get if you get so many leads or you sell so many systems i'm going to give you this bonus 
what if as Christians, it wasn't just, well, we know it's a command. What if I were to put down $1,000? Eight, nine, ten. $1,000 for every gospel presentation you do this week. If I were to tell anybody in here, any, any gospel presentation, you share the gospel, you share about Christ with somebody this week, I will give you $1,000. Would that change your emphasis and your focus? Would that change how passionate you are about sharing the gospel? Unfortunately, I would venture to say, a lot of us would say, man, I, I think I would get about it this week. I could use a thousand bucks. But do we understand the greater eternal reward? It's, it's less about a thousand dollars. It's more about seeing souls saved for eternity for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we've been looking at this, and that's the heartbeat of Christ. We've been looking at this serious gospel life and, and examining how Christ is encouraging us to do that. He's praying for the church as they're going out. And, and interestingly, reading some interesting prayers. If we're going to go out and be effective in this, what does he pray for us? Well, he prays, God, keep them from falling. Keep them, keep them in, in, in the path of righteousness. God, sanctify them by your word. Purify them. Because if they're going to be effective, that's required. We're going to finish out this prayer this morning and look at a couple more of these petitions together. And so um, we've seen these first petitions already. And um, let's jump in now to our next part. Let's pray together and then we'll, we'll continue on here. Father, I pray that you would guide the rest of our time. I desire not to, to push an agenda that's my own personal agenda but to simply reflect your word. And God, I pray that you would help me to proclaim that. And I pray that you'd give us a boldness and a passion. We'd understand the equipping, the ability to go do gospel life to our community, to people around us. As we follow the example of Christ and the command of Christ, clearly doing what you've called us to do. And so I pray that you'd help us then to understand some of the, the things that Jesus prayed as we were being sent out. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we've seen the, the petitions of the Father as we go. Keep them from falling. Sanctify them by your word. But the third one there is unify them in us. Unify them in us. In verses 20 to 23, we specifically see that. And really this petition also falls in the prayer, or in the, in the latter part of your outline, in a good purpose that God has for us is Unity. So you could actually fill this down in letter number or letter number B in the subsection two there that that God desires good for us in unity, but He desires unity. The unity of God's people and the work and life that God has called them to is is highly important to God. Uh, we see that em emphasized by the very fact that He He mentions the fact of oneness six times in this prayer. Six times in his prayers, he's going to send out his, his church, send out his apostles out in the world. He prays, God, keep them one. Oneness is critical. Notice it there, and I'm going to highlight a couple of them in verses 20 to 23. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So who's that? That's us. And not just the apostles who were immediately there at the time, but also those who are going to continue on, who are going to come to faith in Christ, this, this uh, continuation of the church, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. The world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may be perfect in one. I mean, what a clarity that he's praying. God, keep them unified as they do this task. God desires unity amongst his people. I want to take you to a passage in Psalms. David prays this out. It's a prayer of ascent in Psalm 133. It's, it's a prayer of ascent, which means as they would be going up to the temple to sacrifice and to worship they would be praying and singing these psalms. This is all of Psalm 133. It's just three verses. 
But it says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's an interesting statement there. The word there for how pleasant is the word nawim in the Hebrew. It means delightful or sweet. How sweet it is to God. How delightful. Now, I, I am a, I'm one of those guys, I've got a pretty good sweet tooth. I, I like sweets. Um, my kids are the same way. They were delighted when they heard that during the missions month, we're having donuts between Sunday school and church every day. Uh, they're so excited about that. But God says, it is sweet to me. It is delightful to me when the church is one. How blessed, how good, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And then he, then he describes it. He says it's like the, the oil, the special oil that it was made with certain special spices that was poured over the, the high priest's head, running down on the edges of his garment. And then it talks about the dew of Hermon, the, the Mount Hermon in the northern part of Israel, that, that the, the water that runs from there off of Mount Hermon forms the Jordan River and feeds all the irrigation for all the rest of Israel. He says it's like that, how precious that water is. God says, unity is so important and so blessed to me. But the question we have to ask is why? When we're thinking about the gospel as it, the gospel's advance, as we think about gospel life, why is unity in that so important? Well, I, I think three things are relayed here for us. One, Christ knows that it is that we spiritually grow together. Now, we spiritually, uh, our spiritual walk is aided as we do this together. God never intended for us to have to go through the journey of the Christian experience alone. He desired, it was His plan to develop the church. God formed the church. And he's the head of the church and He desired for that, that collectiveness, that corporateness. He calls it a body in 1 Corinthians 12. And so we, we work together. We, we suffer together. We bear one another's burdens and, and fulfill the law of Christ. We help one another and pray for one another. And in fact, in verse 23 here of the text in John 17, he emphasizes that they may be made perfect in one. That they may be made, and the idea there is being made of completion. They, they would grow together and there would be a, uh, we'd be stronger going out as believers to the unity and the fellowship of the one anotherness of the church. We need that. Oh, how much we need that. Did you notice actually in verse 11, as he talks about keep them through your name, those who you've given me that they may be one as we are. He says, oh God, keep them from Satan's distractions. Keep them from Satan, pulling them away from the, the, the truth so that they might be one. They need that together. And, and Satan wants to separate and destroy. He, he knows that the old adage, uh, divide and conquer works. That if he can get us to live isolated Christianity, he can very much more easily uh, help or encourage us to be defeated. It'll keep us from living out our Christianity, keep us from spreading the gospel, from doing gospel life. But Christians who unite together, Christians who work together and encourage each other in their Christian lives, they are more victorious against Satan's attacks. Now, let me read from you uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. Where Paul emphasizes this, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, the word there to keep, endeavoring to keep the unity, is a word that means to guard. He says, Man, I, I'm praying that we would guard that unity as we go forth. As we walk worthy of the calling with which we are called. And so if we are going to be effective in evangelism. If we're going to be powerfully going out and doing this. We need the encouragement of one another. It would be great if we would text each other and say. Hey have you got a chance to share the gospel with anybody yet? Or hey I'm getting ready to go pray. Or I'm getting ready to go talk to this person. Would you be praying for me? 
I love when I get those texts. Hey, pastor, would you be praying? I'm getting ready to go meet with so-and-so to share the gospel. Would you pray for me? Man, that's what the church ought to be doing across the borders in our church, saying, hey, I want to pray for this. Or in our small groups, hey, I'm trying to reach this person. Can we pray for them that they'd come to Christ? That's the unity of the church working together to accomplish the goal that God's given us. And so we grow together spiritually that way. Christ also desires the unity because he knows the greatest blessing is unity in him. He emphasizes that he has that unit with the Father and it's available to us all. So notice that in verse 21, he says, he says in verse 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Isn't that amazing? He's talking about that, that the unity between the Godhead, between God the Son and God the Father, he says, I've got a unity with you, Father, and you've got a unity in me, and I desire my prayer is they also might have that same unity in spirit that we have. Jesus believes that you can have the same unity and fellowship as is contained within the Godhead. That is an astounding prayer. He says, that is the greatest blessing I can give you is fellowship with God in that way. How precious that is. When we think about how, 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 what a blessing that is, that we can have that close fellowship with God in that way, wouldn't that make us want to say, I'm not going to allow discord in the midst of this. I'm not going to allow gossip to spread from my lips because I don't want to harm, harm really my fellowship within the Godhead. And I don't want to destroy things in the church. I'm not going to allow my personal preferences that aren't, critical things to get in the way of the fact that man we are one and i'm one with god and i have fellowship in there and that's where the fullness of my joy is when we start to realize that jesus says that's the blessing that i have for you and then in the third thing i think why this is so important is that christ knows that we are effective our effectiveness is best together that we serve christ better together and really, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm knocking parts of the outline out of order. But really here is, in the second part of the outline, uh, is letter C. That he desires for us to have effectiveness. And that effectiveness is best found in unity. That they may be one. And notice what he says here as he prays. For this prayer of unity in verse 21 and 23, he gives us the result. He says that the world may believe that you sent me. And then in verse 23, that the world may know that you sent me. Let us be unified so that the world may know. That the world may believe. Unity of the church allows the church to be effective to the community. Nothing harms, I think, the, the, the gospels advance more than a church that is fighting one another. They say, man, I don't want anything to do with that. Uh, the gospel is a gospel that, of love, that, that we're going to be transformed by the love of God. Well, it doesn't seem like it's happening in that midst, in that place. So what we can do best is love each other, and the gospel is advanced and in such a powerful way. That's why Paul encourages the Philippian church with this. In Philippians 1, 27, he says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together, why? For the faith of the gospel. Striving together. The word they're striving together is the Greek word athleto. We hear the idea of athletics in there. Soon is together. Together striving, together doing athletics. It's the idea of the teamness, the team aspect. You can't, you can't win a game if you're a one-man team, right? I mean, so I work with my players. You've got to learn to pass. You've got to work together in this. It's a team effort. We win together and we lose together. It's a team effort. And, and the same thing, Paul says, hey, let's keep the unity as we strive together. Why? For the faith of the gospel. 
for gospel life, for the gospel's advanced. And so that's the picture there. It's for the faith, the gospel. Unity is not an end in itself, but a means for evangelism. If believers are not living close to Christ, but are, are divided, fighting, selfish, and the world wants nothing to do with it except maybe to make a reality show out of that. And, and I, let me say this. I'm not proclaiming this because I see any glaring problems in this. That's one of the things that I often been asked when people visit. Man, it seems like there's such a good spirit in the church. What do you attribute that to? And I attribute it to we highlight Jesus Christ and his gospel. And when we all tune to the same pitchfork, that, or the, not pitchfork, the same tuning fork. <laughs> when we all tune to the same tuning fork, we're all in tune. When we all pursue Christ, we want him glorified. We're all facing the same direction. It's when we get turned away from facing Christ and we start looking at ourselves and everything else. That's when there's the problems. And so I, I, I think there's a great spirit in our church. And, and the, the reality is what is beautiful about the church and God's plan for it is the gospel. It, it takes people from all backgrounds, all colors, all cultures, all genders, and it puts them together and makes them one. That was something so foreign to the early New Testament era. The first and second centuries. It's really foreign, really even in our world today, that there would be such unity, no matter what background or color or gender, that there is a loving unity in that. In fact, I love the way Paul says it in Galatians 3, 27, 28. He says, for as many as you were baptized into Christ, you've put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's what unites us. It isn't an economic standard. It isn't a gender standard. It isn't a color standard. It isn't a cultural standard. We are one in Christ Jesus. And let me tell you what. Our world is confused about racial problems. They don't know how to fix it. There is, there is racial uh, frustrations and it's as bitter as ever. According to an NBC News survey and monkey poll, uh, survey monkey poll, they said 64% of Americans say that racism in America and American society remains a major problem. 30% say it still exists today. That, that leaves us with only 6% saying we don't have any problems with it. Only 6% of Americans, when they were polled, said that it's no problem. There isn't any race issues. But I love the fact that the church has the answer for that. And, and by the way, just as a real quick side trail here. You know why it doesn't matter what color? Because God doesn't see it that way. He, he recognizes that we are one blood in Christ Jesus. Acts 17, 26, it says, And God hath made us of one blood all nations of men for, of men to, for to dwell on all the face of the earth. The reality is that there is very little difference between people that is actually recognizable in what we call those, the, those major cultural differences, the racial differences. In fact, here's just a real quick stat for you. I'm going to move this quickly. If one were to take any two people anywhere in the world, scientists have found that the basic genetic differences between these two people would typically be around 0.2%, even if they came from the same people group. But these so-called racial characteristics that people often think are major differences, uh, such as skin color, eye shape, etc., that only accounts for 0.012% of human biological variation, which means we can have the same skin color and we might even be more diverse than someone who has a different skin color. These variations are so minute. Uh, Dr. Harold Freeman, he's the chief executive and the president and director of surgery at North General Hospital in Manhattan. He says, if you ask what percentage of your genes is reflected in your external appearance, the basis by which we talk about race, the answer seems to be in the range of 0.01%. That's exactly what God says. Acts 17, 26. We're really all of one blood. And the church is a place who says, we don't care what your skin color, we don't care what your eye shape is, we don't care what your economic status, we don't care what your gender is. 
we can have a unity in Christ. And we welcome all to come to Christ. And we see the world differently. We see the world differently when we grasp God's desire there. We see that it's, it's people that are souls. I love the way that they, they account for it when, when pilots in aviation or, or uh, uh, captains of ships, when they're asked how many, they're asked, they, they answer, we have 190 souls on board. Everyone is determined as a soul. If we could see that in around us, how many souls do I have in my homeroom class? How many souls do I work with in my workplace? How many souls are in my neighborhood? If we'd have that classification, that's, this is what makes us, uh, that, that God is working that way. I, I like the way Revelation 7 declares it. He says, I looked and beheld a great multitude, which no one could number. This is in heaven of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so that's why we're excited to have missionaries. We support them as they go and they reach brown people in Peru and Chile and, and as they reach uh, students and people in, in South America or South Carolina and as they reach those in Asian countries as well and international students coming to the States as we're going to have them represented by our missionaries in this, this next missions month. That's what we partner with and for the gospel of the unity, of the unity evangelism. So, so we see that third prayer there is that the petition unify them in us so we might serve Christ better together. Let's move to the fourth petition then quickly here. And the fourth petition is Jesus prays very interestingly, bring them with us. Notice verse 24 to the end. He says, Father... I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world, O righteous Father. The world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. He says, God, I, I, I want to see them with me. And have them with me. There's really where it's tied together. This passionate desire of Christ for us. He, he, he's about to face the cross. As he's praying this. He's about to go out from praying this prayer. Go to the garden of Gethsemane. Be betrayed. Have all the trials. Be scourged. Be nailed to a cross. But he looks past it. He looks past it. And he says I can't wait to the, to the completion of all this. I look forward to, Father, when, when, when the saints are all gathered in together. And I, I look forward to the fact that, 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 that those who have loved me and we, we've served will come back together. He comforted his disciples in John 14 and verse, verses 1 through 3, but telling them he was coming again to receive them unto himself, that where I am, there you may be also. He says, I'm going to come back for you again someday. And he was looking forward to that. And we fully grasped that. Doing his will in this life is a motivation for, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give an account for that before him. And, and so the motivation doesn't need to be $1,000 to go do what I'm called to do. The motivation is, man, I'm going to be with Christ. And he's going to say, how did you do? I, I love the picture in Matthew 25 where he gives the parable of the, the master who's going to give talents to his servants. To one he gives five, to another he gives two, and another one he gives one. He goes away for an, an unspecified amount of time. And then he comes back, and he has them give an account for what they done, they've done. And the one who had five used it and doubled it. And he says, here I have now ten talents to give back to you. And Jesus says to him, well done. A good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in little things. I'll make you ruler over many. The one with two comes and says, Well, Lord, I had two and I used that and now I have doubled it and I have four. You know what he says? The exact same thing to the one who doubled the five. Well done, good and faithful servant. 
you've been faithful in little things. I'll make you ruler over, any, over many. You know what that tells me? It doesn't matter whether your talents are two or five. It doesn't matter whether your gifts or abilities are the same as somebody else. You may not be a Billy Graham, but he's made you you. And you have gifts. You have talents. And he says, I want you to use those. And if you use them for me, I'm going to come back and I'm going to check. Don't we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Man, I, I was given the grace of the gospel. It changed my life. And I went and shared that with this many people, God. And you allowed me to be used of you. And I, I, uh, here's, here's others that have come in that have been part of the kingdom of God. He's going to say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Man, I, I, I don't know a better motivation than that. Than that, to hear from him someday, well done. And so scripture re reveals he wants to reward us. And so we've seen that Jesus petitions the Father for us as we go. Very quickly, I want to conclude the, the, the prayer of Jesus in John 17 by, by looking at Jesus' purpose is good for us. In, in, the, in the prayer, we're going to find four statements of purpose predicated by the word that. So he prays, then he gives the result, that they might. So for instance, we're going to see that in verse 11. Father, keep them through your name whom you've given me, that they may be one, like as we are. That's why the first one we gave there was the unity or, or that we see later on in, in verse 13, that they may have my joy. Down there we see later on, that the world may believe that you sent me. Down at the very end of verse 26, that the love with which you've loved me may be in them. So he's going to give the results of his prayer. As we go do what he's called us to do, and the results of this prayer, we've already looked at that they may be one, the desire of unity, that the world may know the desire of for us to have effectiveness. There's just two more I want to just quickly touch on. And the third one there is that they might have joy and that they might have love. That's the second and the fourth one's there. Joy. A purpose of his prayer for us, we might have his joy fulfilled in us. Now look at it there in verse 13. He says, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. His joy. He doesn't just say that they might have joy. He says that they might have my joy. But what's that? What's the joy that comes in perfect fellowship with the Father? He says, I want them to experience all the blessing, the goodness that I have desired for them. That's his joy, that we might walk with Christ. That's why we see in, um, in, in later in 1 John 1, 4, or in Psalm 16, 11, in, in your presence is fullness of joy. In fact, go back just two chapters. Go back to John 15 for just a real quick moment. In John 15, we see that reiterated for us really in verse 11, but let me start in verse 8. He says, by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you be my disciple. So there again, there's our objective, bearing fruit, gospel life. And as the father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. He, he says there, Hey, I want you to have joy, so I want you to do what I've called you to do. Go bear fruit, be effective. I want you to abide and uh, obey my commandments and abide in me. The result is a joyful Christian life. God wants you to have fullness of joy. It's not found anywhere else but in Him and in walking with Him and obedience to Him. Well, that's exciting. I was reading a, an account in the third century, a man by the name of Cyprian. He had gone into law as a young man and was widely known for his eloquence. He became a senator, was just a, a very effective man and became very wealthy in it. Uh, he was rich due to his success and also because of his family inheritance. And he bought 
vast houses and lands and all these things. And um, he, he seemed to have it all going to him all by the age of 45. But he found no joy in all that. And he was struggling. And so he was, uh, he was influenced by the joy of Christians who were being severely persecuted. And he observed this. These Christians who were being just beaten and some of them slain. And yet they had a joy. They would sing and praise. And he thought something doesn't match. He wrote then a letter to a friend of his. Just shortly thereafter this. A friend named Donatus. He says, there seems, he says, this seems a cheerful world, Donatus, when I view it from this fair garden under the shadow of these vines. But if I climbed some great mountain and looked out over the wide lands, you know very well what I would see. Brigands on the high road, pirates on the seas, in the amphitheaters, men murdered to please the applauding crowds. Under all roofs, there is misery and selfishness. It really is a bad world, Donatus, an incredibly bad world. Yet in the midst of it, I have found a quiet and holy people. They have discovered a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of this sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They have overcome the world. These people, Donatus, are the Christians. And then he says, and I have decided to become one of them joy that is known as we walk in Christ. So we share the gospel and live it out. That's God's desire for you. Cyprius, or Cyprian then was baptized after his salvation, was ordained to the ministry, became the bishop of Carthage, and ended up giving his life later on as one of those martyrs. So God desires for us to have joy. The last thing I want you to notice is his desire is that we might Oh, we already had it up there. That we might have love. Verse 26, he finishes this out. I have declared to them your name, and we'll declare it, that, here it is, that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. He wants us to have the love of the Father. Our world is, as the old song says, looking for love in all the wrong places. But we know where it is. It's in Christ Jesus that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. In this is love, 1 John 4. Not that we loved him, but that he first loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He says, I want them to walk in love. I want them to share that love with others around them. That's available. So we have an incredible gospel to share with people. Jesus was about to give his life and then commission the church to send us out to go do gospel life, to continue the ministry that he began, spreading the gospel, preaching the gospel, caring for people, sharing the good news. He says, I want you to continue this. And as I send you, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that you would, that you would be uh, kept from evil, that you're going to be sanctified by the truth, that you'll be united, that you'll have the, the joy and the love and the effectiveness. And that someday you'll come home and be with me, and I'll be able to tell you, well done, good and faithful servant. Man, what an incredible encouragement for us. You know, at the beginning of the message, I put down $1,000 on the pulpit and asked, would, would that be a motivation? Would you share the gospel more if that were your motivation? I think as we look at the scriptures, that doesn't compare to what God has for us. We ought to be passionate for it just because of the goodness of it. And so all we do is simply ask people, do you know Christ is your Savior? Do you have the joy and the love that's available to you in Christ? It's, it's not that it's difficult. We have the greatest message to give to people if we'd simply mention it, if we'd simply talk about it. It's, am it's amazing how many more people are affected by simple questions. In 2010, when the state of Texas put into law that now when people renew their license or get their license, um, they are have to, the, the, the people that work there at the borough 
have to ask the question, would you like to be an organ donor? They found since 2010, when that became a requirement by law, they had to ask that. They found that the people who said yes doubled. The numbers doubled. How much more would we see people coming to Christ if we simply said, hey, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Are you saved? A simple question. If we simply ask it. That's gospel life. Let's do it for him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the glorious gospel that you've given to each one of us. That, that we can have our sins forgiven. Through your grace, we don't deserve it. But you freely give it to us. God, as you, you now have commissioned us to go be your ambassadors. To follow the example of Christ. God, would you give us boldness from the motivation that, that you've given us in your word. Would you give us boldness to just go ask people. And God, may we as a church lift up each other and encourage each other. That we might say, hey, would you pray for me? I'm trying to talk to this person. Would you pray? Or, hey, I, I, how did that conversation go? God, give us the oneness together for this. Oh, God, that we would see scores and scores and hundreds of people come to know you as their Savior. God, I know that's your heartbeat. You're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to be passionate about this commission passion about what you've called us to do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.